Wonderful. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Michael Meeling, as mentioned um, at MIT, but I'm today actually representing Ecologic Institute, a transatlantic think tank on whose board I have the pleasure to be on. And um, our session, session one, is mapping the broader climate ecosystem, latest trends from government, business, and finance, which I think nicely reflects the fact that climate change is obviously a very, very multifaceted problem. And if you look back or think back 25 to 30 years, action at that time was pretty much almost entirely driven by national governments, early pioneering research, but of course also the first efforts at collective solutions were taking place in the international negotiations. And everything that's happening on the other side of the river in the UN campus still pretty much reflects this classic multilateral diplomacy approach. But we've also learned over time that you know, this approach of national governments trying to find solution hits road bumps. And I think, especially since Paris, but already in the years before that, we've really seen that in many cases, subnational actors, subnational governments, cities, states, provinces, private sector businesses, and civil society organizations can move nimbler, can accelerate action, can move faster than the national governments. And I think it's one of the real breakthroughs of the Paris regime that it tries to bring together this important level of action with the traditional sort of national government action. The, uh, the, the non-state actor zone for climate action, Nazca is a good example of that. Our panel is wonderfully equipped to illustrate this other dimension of climate action and to talk about how we can try to align and synergize between the two worlds of national government-driven action and all these other actors who do such important contributions. I'll quickly introduce them. So we'll start with Gino Van Begin, of Secretary General of ICLE, the Local Governments for Sustainability. We then follow with Frank Elderson, who is Executive Director of the Nederlandse Bank, we then have Alzibieta Klein, who is Director and Global Head of Climate Business at the International Finance Corporation at the World Bank Group. Then Jukka Wosukainen, who is Director of Climate Technology Center and Network, um, which is affiliated or part of the United Nations. And finally, Rod Richardson, who is the President of the Grace Richardson Fund. I'd start, um, Gino, asking you, so it's very clear, of course, that not only is a lot of the vast majority of future growth going to take place in cities, um, and with that also, of course, a good share of future emissions, but cities are also extremely exposed to climate. They're very vulnerable. What does ICLE do to, to facilitate action? Thank you cities? very much, uh, Michael, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, is this working? Okay. Um, yes, indeed. Um, ICLE, we work with 1,500 cities um, around the globe, um, we have um, been established in 1990. So just before the uh, Rio summit and the launch of the uh, first uh, uh, climate convention, and actually already in 1993, we kicked off um, first local actions for uh, climate um, with our own program that we had. And as I said, in the meanwhile, this has grown to more than 1,500 cities around the world. We keep as ICLE also the, um, um, the co focal point position um, to report to the UNFCCC at each of these COPs and during the years of the COPs as well of what is going on at the um, uh, local and regional level. And in that sense, indeed, um, more than 15 years that we have been advocating towards uh, the uh, parties at, of the UNFCCC to take on the um, potential that exists and to support the potential that exists at local and regional level. And I would just not, would not like to go and bring you to the entire history of it, but I give you a couple of points where we are actually today. Um, within our organization, within the network, more than 1,000 jurisdictions, entities of subnational level from 86 countries um, who represent 800 million people um, report to us their commitments that they have passed through city council or other council levels, more than 1,900 Climate targets have been adopted since then. More than 7,000 mitigation and adaptation actions are ongoing amongst these 1,000 uh, entities. And that represents a commitment to reduce 5.6 gigatons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions until 2020. And that is a very important figure because, as you know, the, uh, since the Paris Agreement, which, by the way, also now and we have worked very hard to that, um, uh, officially also encourage the parties to work with their other levels of, of, of government. 
the Paris Agreement um, and its implementation is foreseen to be done via the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions of the nations. And those that are on the table as we speak today um, from the nations do not get us to the two degrees. There is still a gap of 16 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions that are not committed by nations to be, um, to be reduced. So the 5.6 gigatons that we try to bring on the table um, that is, is facilitated by um, local and regional uh, governmental action is therefore of really of an importance. And we made that case in particularly here in Bonn uh, since the Paris Agreement has been implemented. We are not seeking any more um, the support to engage with, with local and regional governments or to recognize it's all that is done. It is part of the agreement. What we have now done here and what we still do over the last two weeks is actually to be at the territory um, of the, um, of the uh, parties and we have on Sunday brought together more than 360 leaders um, here uh, to Bonn with 1,000 participants to demonstrate that potential and have that conversation. Now, um, um, I, I may conclude by saying that we are now in the implementation phase. The NDC's partnership is a very important element in that. We have been, um, as ICLE, um, our application to join that partnership has been approved by the board, and yesterday we launched that, um, that uh, partnership or our offer to that partnership. So we invite indeed parties to make use of the vertical and horizontal integration to connect climate change across all levels. Um, when it comes now to the financing, um, let me say here that um, from local and regional government level, there is indeed a um, lack of capacities for local and regional governments to actually seize the opportunities that the um, upcoming financing uh, is provided. And at many of those dialogues that we are having here these days, um, it is said again and again that money is becoming available, but um, it, it may not be even sufficient. But what is the most important thing is that the projects are missing. Mm -hmm. So we, what we try to do now is via various um, um, uh, instruments, but in particular our own um, transformative action plan instrument where we try to bring local government to help them to conceptualize at least their ideas and then facilitate those ideas to uh, a number of financial institutions who will then take it up further and see um, whether these projects are um, uh, financiable and bankable. Most important though here is however that we want these projects to be um, really interconnected. It's not only about climate, it's actually about ensuring um, the improvement of quality of life and therefore um, that these respect also all sustainability criteria. Wow, it's an impressive amount of action. Thank you very much. So switching from government, but at the local level now to the financial sector, if you like, although of course had the interface with the government. Frank, um, first of all, you work in your position to line governments and private sector and finance, but you also launched the Dutch platform for sustainable finance and you chair that still. I, I'd be very interested in, in hearing what your work, in your work you do to, to synergize between the two sectors. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Michael, and thank you for having uh, me on this panel. And you might ask yourself, what is a central bank and a supervisor of banks, pension funds and insurance undertakings um, doing at a, at a session about, about, about climate? Um, um, and I will, uh, I hope that in the next three, four minutes or so, I can uh, make clear to you why we feel that this is very much an uh, inherent part of our, of our legal mandate. Um, and in doing so, I will be talking about risks and I will be talking about opportunity. And I will be talking about how, um, in my view, the private and especially the, the financial sector and the public sector can and need uh, work together in order to transform uh, the world. Um, and in doing so, I will also explain to you that we are a leverage organization. Um, uh, we have leverage on the financial sector and that gives a very special responsibility, I also think, in the way that we exercise our, our mandate. Um, now, what is that mandate? That mandate is to safeguard financial stability. And um, um, we, uh, being a, a supervisor, we always start with risks. But the exciting part maybe is in the opportunity. So I will come to that in a second. But we start with risks. And, uh, and we look at how um, financial institutions manage their risks in this realm. Um, and there we typically make a distinction between physical risks and transition risks. 
physical risks. You know, the, the, the Netherlands, where I'm from, it's, um, you know, half of it is below sea level. Uh, so um, not too long ago, um, we published a report um, in which um, we looked at uh, the, the risk of flooding. And, um, um, and um, th 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 I, I will not go into all the details in um, th explaining to you what kind of um, recommendations we came up with in terms of the banking sector and the insurance sector. But what I want to show you is that by, um, by, by doing such a research, by doing such an exam, by visiting all the financial institutions and asking them a question about this, we also raised their consciousness um, in terms of the very importance of them managing their climate related risks. So that is one example. The other example has to do with transition risks. Um, governments will respond. Uh, and earlier today we heard um, some of the very distinguished earlier speakers uh, the, saying the very importance of legislation. Um, uh, first of all, of course, um, a carbon pricing, which we are very much in favor of, uh, but also the setting of certain deadlines. Um, a very specific example that we have been looking at um, also in this report I was just referring to is um, a rule that says now in the Netherlands that as of the 1st of January 2023 all office buildings need to have a C label of energy efficiency or higher. Now you could say this is a very detailed kind of little thing. However, banks, insurance undertakings, pension funds, they are very heavily invested in um, office buildings. So they need to know whether these office buildings already have a C label or higher, or realize that uh, by the time we get to the 1st of January 2023, these office buildings can no longer be let out and therefore are no longer worth uh, much, if, if, if at all. So. Again, by us doing research here, we raise consciousness on the one hand, um, but we also make sure uh, that um, institutions, uh, by having raised this consciousness, see there are opportunities. Because, and that is actually the link to the opportunities I would like to do um, and explain to you, because um, immediately banks see that there's an opportunity in helping their clients if they have office buildings that do not have this C label in order to get there in time. Uh, and there is there is very good competition there, uh, and so the whole process is being sped up. So there, what you see is the very um, um, positive uh, interaction between government setting deadlines, uh, and I think that we will do so increasingly, not just in the Netherlands but also worldwide. Deadlines in terms of when will we have uh, all residential buildings um, having an A label? When will we uh, prohibit fossil cars? When will, will we? All of these deadlines will have to be met. These are risks for the financial sector, but the other side of the coin will also will always be that there are opportunities to help their clients to meet these uh, these deadlines. Now. This is one part of the story. The other side of the story is that we need to scale. We need to scale up. And how have we done this? And this was your specific question. We have brought together as a central bank, not so much without our, within our clear mandate of safeguarding financial stability, but a little bit more in terms of our being an institution that has convening power. It just so happens that when a central bank invites um, financial institutions and others, they just come. Um, so we have convening power, we have agenda setting power, and we use this. So we, we, we set up this, um, this, this platform for sustainable finance in which our representative umbrella organization of the banks, of the insurance undertakings, of the pension funds, of the investment firms, but also, crucially, the uh, relevant ministries. So there we bring together the entire financial sector in the Netherlands and the, um, the, the relevant public, uh, public partners and also academia. And there what we try to do is to, um, um, to foster dialogue, to scale, to make sure that when there is a good idea within the banking sector, this can be horizontalized, so to speak, as soon as possible to the entire financial sector. And also, crucially, to make sure that there's alignment between what is happening in the financial sector on the one hand and what is happening on the other hand in the public sector in terms of the climate law, in terms of the NGCs, etc. Let me stop there for the moment. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you. Much appreciated. Alves Bitter, um, you had climate business at the IFC, which is the private sector arm of the, of the World Bank Group. So from your experience in, in that line of work, how do you see sort of the opportunities for the private sector to engage in climate finance and to become participants? Thank you, Michael. So uh, pleasure to be on this panel. And uh, as, you, as you pointed out earlier in your own introduction, Paris Agreement actually opened up opportunities to bring a number of actors to make things happen. 
Uh, so we are the largest investor in emerging markets, and when you start thinking about what is being built today in emerging markets, every two years we are building a new global economy. When you look at the construction sector, 70% of what is being built worldwide is being built in emerging markets. So this is where things happen, and this is where we need to start thinking, how do we bring actors together to make things happen? I'm going to take one example which points out to what is already happening out there. If you just looked at renewable energy in 2016, 250 billion plus has been invested in renewable energy. Our own investment in that space was just under a billion in 2016. And if you look at all the other multilaterals and bilaterals <laughs> and uh, other government agencies, they total no more than five billion. So what this tells you is that 245 billion is invested by the market, by private sector, to make things happen. And this is the power of the Paris Agreement, to be able to bring all these actors to make things happen. Uh, last year, we uh, published a report where we looked at NDCs of um, 20, uh, 21 um, emerging markets and what investment opportunity that would bring if we were to act on those NDCs. And that investment opportunity is $23 trillion. I mean, those are mind-boggling numbers, but when you start peeling it, when you start looking at what is already happening, as, as I mentioned, in renewable, quarter billion, in climate smart agri, another half a billion, and the numbers actually stack up. So what is exciting about climate today, compared to, say, 10 years ago, is that it is a threat, but it's also a huge opportunity, and it's a huge opportunity for businesses. So what does it look like when you look at uh, constellation of actors, when you look at ecosystem of actors who need to play together to make it happen? So obviously, first of all, you've got project developers. What do project developers want? They want to get paid, um, and they want to get financed. You look at banks, a lot of banks are financing renewable energy. On our platform, we have about 750 banks in emerging markets, most of them systemically important, and many of them, I would say top 50 to 100 for sure, are already looking at green finance and doing it. We have supported several of them issuing green bonds. And as, as you mentioned a moment ago, role of regulators. We are hosting something called Sustainable Banking Network, which is 34 regulators from emerging markets, which are telling the banks what they need to do to green. So we've got a bunch of banks who are doing it on their own, but then regulators coming in, just like you do in the Netherlands, in 34 emerging markets and pushing that down to make it happen. When you look at uh, governments, they need to issue proper, uh, they need to have proper regulatory environment and proper business environment to make things happen. And again, we are seeing some green shoots in emerging markets. Some of them uh, are thinking carbon pricing. Some of them are trying to limit fossil fuel development. So it's a bit patchy, but it's starting to be there as part of the ecosystem. The last part of the ecosystem is the consumer. And here is, it's, it's a very exciting development. If you look at Top 20 pension funds in the world, they have 0.2% of their assets in green, 0.2%. Their customers, their clients, their future pensioners are telling them, we'd like to have a lot more in that portfolio. So they are out there trying to look for green assets. That's why you see huge growth of green bonds, 30, 40, 50% growth every year for the past six, seven years. So we've got consumers who would like to live in green buildings, who would like to have their pension funds invested in green assets, who are asking for that. They don't want to take a cut on the returns. They don't want to take a cut on comfort. But the technology is allowing them to be part of the conversation and pushing various actors, whether it be bankers, uh, their asset managers, construction companies, and others to make it happen. So this is the ecosystem as we see it. And again, the most exciting part today is that it is already happening. And Paris Agreement allowed for that to flourish and to make it happen. Thank you, Thank you Alex Peter. Um, Jukka, um, many of us know you as the head negotiator for Finland, but now you've moved to Copenhagen, if I'm correct, and there you're running the Climate Technology Centre and Network. Um, and in your work, as I understand it, so technology, for those who don't know, is one of the pillars, obviously, of the UN climate regime alongside finance. We're talking primarily about finance today, but technology is absolutely crucial. You work in transferring clean technology, technology for climate resilient development, capacity building is part of your, of your work portfolio, and also um, providing legal and policy advice. Describe how, how CTCN contributes to bridging this gap between government and private sector and other actors. Okay, th thank you. Let me indeed uh, enlighten you that uh, Climate Technology Center was established exactly on the same moment when Green Climate Fund was 
established. They might be maybe more suitable here to in the panel, but we are very little brother uh, to that uh, mighty elephant fund for climate. But we are under convention, we are under guidance of the convention, and we serve the developing countries as a, one of those rare operative bodies of the conventions. And we need to show to our developing country partners that there is some, somebody there for them serving their needs. Uh, we are open for all developing countries on their request. So similar kind of structure, country, totally country-driven uh, service. Uh, now at the moment, we have only three years' time. We, since three years when we started, we served 70 developing countries, more than 100 technology assistance requests. So we bring the best technology expertise from our 400 institution network to the use of developing countries. Now, what they ask? They ask uh, policy issues. They need to have uh, new uh, environment ef uh, energy efficiency master plan. That they need to reshape their legislation for renewable energies. Um, they need to have tools and methods how to protect their coastal zones and, and, and cities, like Jakarta. They need new models, hydrodynamic uh, models, and, and, and so on. They need tools, they need policies, they need measures. And, and what is great is that the Paris Agreement seems to be somehow Oh yeah, some people might be a bit pessimistic how fast it goes, and, and we know about gap, exactly. There is a huge gap in implementing, but developing countries are on move. They have woken up, they are coming to us, and they are almost queuing. I have, I have a queue of 20 governments representatives coming and asking technology choice, technology need, what they can do. Um, they want to do an uh, enabling environment for new investments, climate-friendly investments in their countries. And it's not only governments, it's about the cities, it's about the businesses. Like the uh, latest boom is that they want to, to see what are the climate smart cities in their countries. And that means I, I put back to ICLEI that how can we work together so that we can have that model, which is of course has to be locally adapted to and, and so on. So I, I, I'm now uh, kind of quite positive on that we set up something in Paris which is now on moving. We have to just be able to respond to, to these this, uh, needs. Now, what we are telling to developing countries, and we are serving <coughs> much, in, let's say, lesser developed and, and smaller countries than emerging economies where, where already uh, big financial uh, actors are on the move there, that uh, Technology and innovation as such is, is not enough. It has to be put into use with the private sector. We have to be able to bridge innovation or, or pro best priority technologies to, to that landscape of, of businesses who can take it up and who can really create the markets. And, and this is something that I'm trying to tell that every mitigation action of the country is a business case. And we need to find that business model where we find those beneficiaries, those customers. And it, it takes us a bit beyond our kind of comfort zone in that technology issues. But on the other hand, it's, it's, it's very important because it seems to be that there is, a, there is a space, a vacuum of good quality project development. IFC, for example, usually wants to have already, and, and all the other funds want to have a very good quality, non-risk project proposals on their desks. But who is doing that one? Mm -hmm. And there is not grant money. Nobody has grant money. Everybody has got uh, equities and, and loans and, 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 and so on. Somebody has to do that job. We are doing partly, because we are, but we are very small one. We have only working on $10 million per year. That is not enough to make the transformation. And we need partners, and, and that's why we are looking at it. But uh, that's what we are doing. That's the gap we are, we are uh, bridging in. Uh, it's it, it's exciting, exciting world at the moment. I must confess so far, four very optimistic and energetic um, comments, and I think the last one will, will go in the same line, Rod, at, at the um, Grace Richardson Fund. I know you've been working and researching the prospects for, um, for, carbon, for 
um, clean tax cuts, which seems a very, very interesting, promising idea. And I think Jigar Shaw, the um, founder of Sun Edison and also co-founder of the Carbon War Room, wrote not long ago that he could see clean tax cuts accelerating clean infrastructure deployment by two to three hundred percent by democratizing participation in this market. So, can you explain the concept of clean tax cuts and what potential you see there? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Michael, and thank you my fellow panelists and everyone here for, for coming uh, to help us figure out how to accelerate uh, all these solutions that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, clean tax cuts is, is, uh, take, is, a, is a concept which uh, takes notice of trends that you have mentioned here. Uh, but we, you know, we believe that the markets have actually moved faster than the policymakers, uh, and you know, all policy that we have now today to address climate was really developed 10, 20, 30 years ago, and it was developed in a time when most clean solutions were not profitable. Now, the latest trend that we've seen is that these solutions are becoming profitable. Since 2011, for wind, is now has a lower LCOE than fossil fuels. 2015, uh, for, for solar power. Uh, and that coincides, if you notice, with the creation of the green bond market. The green bond market took off in 2012, growing about uh, 3,600 wait a minute, 3,600 percent, 3,600 percent in that time. That's a huge growth rate, but it is all keyed on profitability. Um, that profitability means that, that, that all, the other, all the other policies that were created were created in an environment where since clean solutions couldn't be profitable, you had to have a price adjustment mechanism to make them work. You had to have a price support subsidy or a carbon tax or some kind of control mechanism, cap and trade, something that would account for the, to, to boost those things into profitability. That's no longer the case. Uh, and we, we, we now see that these older policies are, in fact, becoming constraining and constricting. Uh, for instance, in the United States, we have a, a solar industry which is dominated by 15 to 17 major players, five of whom are banks. Okay, and that's because only the largest players, the Berkshire Hathaways, can take advantage of the full uh, value of that tax equity. Only they can absorb it. The other players can't do that, but they have to be big enough to afford a tax equity trading department. Uh, and then most of the money will go to the bankers, uh, you know, uh, and, and it will not go to the solar projects. So <clears throat> what Jigger, uh, Jigger Shaw, who, who founded Sun Edison and really made the, uh, created the uh, solar market in the United States uh, sees, is that you know, we need a different kind of mechanism that focuses not on price, but on capital acceleration. Because that's the real problem. The problem is how do you uh, replace these inefficient financing mechanisms? They, they, they were a rope ladder that helped these companies claw their way into economic reality. But now, that once, the, the, once those things have become profitable, that rope ladder collapses, and it becomes a noose constraining the market. And um, so what clean tax cuts takes notice of is that we, there still is a problem caused by the fact that there are free riders out there who produce waste and dump that cost on the taxpayer. And that, that, that creates barriers to capital for the clean capitalists who do not dump those costs on the taxpayer. So in our view, the best way to address a barrier to capital is to drop the barriers to capital. And one of the significant barriers to capital is taxes. So, you know, this idea was, uh, well, well, we'd been working on this idea before 2015. We waited until 2015 because that's when solar crossed the line and joined energy efficiency and electric cars and all kinds of other things uh, as being a, a profitable, clean solution. And th there were profitable solutions across the economy. So, therefore, what might work is cutting the tax rates that investors pay in clean solutions. Um, and if you really want to accelerate those markets, you, you target the capital tax rates that investors pay on debt and equity. Uh, 
This idea was first introduced uh, in, in uh, June of 2016. This is very new, publicly introduction of June, June of 2016. And it's been developed almost entirely using something called charrette process, which are expert level working groups. Uh, you know, two, two of the charrettes were held at Columbia. Nature Conservancy uh, held a charrette. The different groups that were involved in the first charrette uh, you know, each of, each of those different partners in that charrette uh, uh, held up their hands and said, we want to do the next one. Uh, and, and we broke it up by sectors. So uh, Columbia University took the green bond market. R Street Institute took uh, transportation. The Nature Conservancy took farming, forestry, and land use. Uh, University of Colorado took oil and gas, and on and on. Um, Bill Brandt, who spoke uh, yesterday uh, at ASU, took the clean tech sector, for instance. Um, you know, one of the most promising of these mechanisms that Jigger was focusing on was this idea that was developed at Columbia University uh, called the, the tax-exempt clean asset bond. Uh, it's, it's a green bond where tax exemption is conferred because of the public benefit uh, of the uh, underlying assets that are being financed, uh, that re because of they reduce waste, inefficiency, emissions, uh, you know, and th so there's a, a public benefit beyond normal commercial activity. Uh, and that would, uh, you know, in our view, merit tax exemption. So what that does is it lowers the cost. It not only makes these uh, instruments more attractive, it's, it's a higher ROI, return on investment. You increase the investment, you increase the supply. But it decreases, it, it lowers the cost of capital for the issuer and lowers the cost of the outputs. So you also have cheaper clean energy and cheaper clean, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, cars and things like that. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that really caught Jigger's attention was that you would move from a situation where you have this market that's dominated by 15 major companies, and suddenly you create an instrument that every retiring baby boomer in America would want to put in their retirement portfolio as a linchpin of their portfolio. So suddenly you democratize the financing of, of, uh, of clean infrastructure. Uh, so you move from a market where you have 15 major players to where you have you know, maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of, of investors. Uh, and on, on the equity side, uh, you know, if you go from the situation where, you know, only a few people can use these tax credits to using, uh, you know, just a modest tax rate reduction, well then, every single guy with a pickup truck and a work crew, uh, you know, can, can say, well, you know, I can build a, a house uh, or I can do, solar deployments and energy efficiency deployments, and I'll have a lower tax rate. And oh, I think I'll do more of that and push more of that to my customers and market more of that. And suddenly, you go from this 15 major players on the, on the business side to a market that looks more like the construction industry uh, with 50,000 players. So that's why you know, th this can democratize the, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, industry in a very powerful way. Uh, and it, you know, even more so, you know, we, we are here, the reason I'm here talking to you uh, is that we are looking to uh, start a new charrette uh, to explore the idea of international tax exemption for green bonds. Because we think that there is the possibility, perhaps, of an international capital market uh, for these instruments that is tax exempt, where any developer, company, bank, private developer, anywhere in the world, could issue these bonds in any market, London, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tokyo, uh, in New York, uh, and sell these to investors around the world, and it would be tax exempt for those investors in their country. So think about the democratization in terms of climate justice. We heard from Mary Robinson earlier today. There was a lady from Tanzania talking about how do we, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, finance, uh, the, you know, clean charcoal. Mm -hmm. Well, this would be a great way to do it. Uh, you know, yep. so you could you you could see how you know a project in in uh, Tanz uh, Tanzania could be financed by uh, you know 
retiring baby boomers in, in uh, you know, the United States. Rod, that's a great segue, I think, to opening it to the audience, who is essentially representing the democracy or the participants. We don't have much time, so instead of having another round of moderated questions, I really think we should give it over to the audience, but I do want to reserve at least a minute or two for each of you to have a closing comment as well. Um, and when I say questions from the audience, I really do mean the type of questions with the question mark ideally short. Please do introduce yourself and your affiliation, if indeed we have any questions. Yes, back here, the microphone is coming. Thank you, I'm <clears throat> a journalist from Malta, Vanya Wokali, the Malta Business Weekly. The World Future Council has proposed that central banks should actually buy green bonds. Do you think this is a viable solution? And what about using special drawing rights from the IMF to finance uh, climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation? Is that viable? And the third proposal is debt for climate change swaps. I believe there's only one project at the moment involving a small Commonwealth country being run by the IMF. So three, a three-part question, essentially. Do any of you want to take the first stab? Frank? Well, maybe all three questions are a little bit too much, but let me take the one on uh, what central banks can do. Um, I think that many times the focus is immediately on what central banks can do with monetary policy. Uh, and that is also immediately the most controversial question. Um, I think central banks can do much more than just focusing on that. Uh, and that was the role that I tried to uh, explain earlier in terms of um, us having convening power and agenda setting power. Uh, we, can, uh, we can organize conferences, we can uh, do research, uh, we can uh, reach out to the financial sector and, and use the leverage that, that, that we have. Um, and there I think there is still a world to be won, not just by each, and, um, each single central bank, uh, but also if you like uh, by double leverage institutions such as the IMF. Uh, the IMF goes around the world uh, doing what we call financial sector assessment programs, FSAPs. Mm -hmm. um, and they came to the Netherlands and they, um, they visited us for two weeks or three weeks. And I looked at their uh, report um, uh, in the beginning, in the draft, and there was nothing on all that we doing, are doing in terms of, um, um, of sustainability and green finance. And I asked them, didn't you notice uh, because we've been so active mm -hmm. and they said well yes we did notice and we and we love uh, that you do all this but it's not in our methodology although we go all around the world and we do all these financial sector assessment programs so we talk to central banks we talk to supervisors we talk to ministries of finance we talk to the private sector and the financial sector uh, but it's not in our methodology now there I think is something that in the central banking world um, and um, if you like a little bit larger uh, in, in, in institutions such as the IMF uh, we can we can make um, a big stride forward uh, in order to use that double leverage if you like so that um, um, central banks and supervisors then use their leverage on the financial sector um, mm -hmm. so maybe that is what i would like to answer to uh, to those questions sorry, like to absolutely uh, please on green bonds so uh, i think i'm gonna come slightly different way on that uh, look uh, what we are seeing in the market today is a tremendous growth in green bonds and literally it we are expecting to come at about 130 to 140 billion this year from about 70 to 80 last year. So what does this tell you? That tells you that there is a huge demand in the market for those bonds. Our clients and ourselves, we were just in a bond market two weeks ago. We issued a benchmark $1 billion green bond. We are AAA rated. That was gone in under 30 minutes. There is a huge demand from asset managers to have those in the portfolios. So when the question was about putting it into, uh, into portfolios of uh, central banks, I think we don't have enough supply for that. And uh, what we should be doing is let the market buy that because there is a demand for this. Why would we crowd out this market with public money? Let's use public money where it's really, really needed and where it needs to have that boost rather than coming to the product which is already well accepted in the market and where people actually want a lot more of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned that if there's a supply constriction. Is this something that the tax exemption could potentially help alleviate by well, th pushing this supply? This is essentially a supply side uh, solution. Uh, so yes, this would, this would greatly increase the supply. I mean, if you look at it from the point of view of, of the market, uh, we're talking about creating a new kind of financial
instrument. This would be the tax-exempt corporate or privately issued mm -hmm. green bond, uh, which does not currently exist. Mm -hmm. So this would, in the American context of the, the bond market, um, I don't know what you do in tax exemption in Europe so well, but we have municipal bond tax exemption. Mm -hmm. uh, cities and states and government agencies can ex issue tax exempt bonds. So that's one level of the market. Then you have the corporate bond market, and that's uh, the muni bond market is 3.7 trillion in America and about 35 or 37 trillion corporate bond market, much bigger corporate bond market. This is a new uh, kind of instrument. Uh, corporate tax exempt bond market. It would have a, uh, you know, a, a possibly a little bit higher interest rate than the munis, which are backed by the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. A little bit higher risk profile, but a higher reward. And um, I think it would be a lower cost of capital for the issuer than anything else they can get. Mm -hmm. uh, and a, maybe a higher tax free return for the investor than anything else they can get. So it would be, uh, you know, you might have to do something for pension funds like make sure that the tax uh, exemption flows through to the pensioner. Uh, so there might be a little bit of room there so that you make sure that it's attractive to the pension funds. Uh, but yes, it could vastly increase the supply because of that. And I'd like to ask whether the central bank would like to help us convene a discussion <laughs> about this Please. tool. Absolutely. Oh. Um, it's very, very, uh, very good that you asked this question because I've been thinking to use your your example as a, you know the tax exempt um, green bond as how um, why it is so important to have a good governance in place such as the platform for sustainable finance that we have because if it's such an idea comes up. Yes. By, um, by a private sector um, um, a party. What we have put in place is a way to immediately um, get that to a table where all actors that are needed to actually put that into practice are already there. Immediately. So, um, so we <laughs> <laughs> it's an institutionalized charade. Really like <laughs> but, yeah. so, so but this is just one example, but there are many others. Uh -huh. And so what you so it's helpful that you need not build a coalition every time a good idea comes up, mm -hmm. but you ha that you have a governance sitting there. Um, being able to immediately horizontalize or uh, de 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 democratize, as you put it, um, a good idea, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 give skill to it and 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 speed it up. So um, so I will certainly give thought uh, to to this suggestion. Thank Great, you. you know, because this is a very new idea. As I said, the the Columbia Group <coughs> came up with this in March of this year, so it's less than a year old, and we are we really are looking for partners who want to help us develop this idea in the international context. So if there's anyone here who would like to, to partner with us, please let me know. Uh, because these kinds of ideas cannot be developed by one institute alone. They need, they need a, a, a group of stakeholders mm -hmm. uh, to, to develop, make sure they're developed fairly uh, and in the right way that takes into the concerns of everyone involved. We have a question here in the front row, I believe. There's a microphone nearby. Yes, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, and thank you, panel. Uh, my name's John Moorhead from uh, BST Consulting, and I just wanted to share very quickly a disclosure and ask a perhaps a somewhat counterintuitive uh, question to you, if I may. So the disclosure is that on 31st of October, together with Thomson Reuters and CDP, we published a report on the 250 largest listed uh, emitters. Um, the total uh, emissions are about 41 gigatons uh, of uh, emissions, which is about 80% of anthropogenic emissions. Of course, you have to account for double counting because we included their value chains in that calculation. And so uh, at, at about 60%, to be conservative, uh, we're still talking about a third of anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So my, my, my question to you uh, is in terms of engaging with the most carbon intensive industries as well, uh, in terms of their decarbonization, and perhaps rather than a green bond, we would call it a decarbonization bond, but um, they're the companies that we also need to, I believe, partner with. So I'd like to hear from the panel, how can finance engage with those uh, heavy emitters as well. And heavy hitters indeed. Um, any, any thoughts or ideas? 
I can uh, address it from the claim. Wait, do you want to? Let Alice Beta take the first, first, and then Rod right after. Sure. Okay. Well, you know, the University of Colorado conducted a, uh, a charrette on uh, applying the clean tax cut concept to the fossil fuel industry, to oil and gas, and we looked specifically at. Uh, using clean tax cuts to incentivize the um, deployment of equipment that could reduce uh, emissions at the wellhead. So th this was a very focused, it, we didn't look at the, all the industry issues, uh, but this is, uh, you know, the first stab at, at looking at how you could uh, craft this kind of a, a, a mechanism so that you could actually change the practices in the industry to reduce their emissions. Uh, but I believe that you could probably go a lot farther than that. Uh, you know, in, in every dollar worth of, of fossil fuels, there is locked in there about four dollars worth of carbon fiber. So if you could incentivize innovation to, to bring down the costs of getting out that carbon fiber, what you would end up with is uh, carbon fiber and clean energy. So I believe that, uh, you know, the kind of uh, policy structure that we're proposing tilts the playing field in such a direction that you will turn those fossil fuel companies gradually over time into, uh, you know, they will be in the business of carbon fiber, carbon materials and clean energy and they, what we will see uh, diminishing is dirty combustion. You may see other processes to get energy out of fossil fuels, like electrochemical conversion, uh, for instance, and things like that. Um, so I, I think that you know it, this policy can uh, help. I don't know if it will. It's a panacea, uh, you know, but I think that it can direct those industries in a good direction. Let's see if I speak to has. Uh, just from a slightly different perspective, so uh, the debate is out there whether we should be issuing green bonds on fundamentally brown balance sheets, right? And so what we've seen in terms of issuers today, we've seen uh, three sovereign issuers, last one was Fiji, uh, which issued a couple of weeks ago, we've seen Poland, where 90% of electricity comes from coal, and they issued a green bond to back up whatever was the 10% the on renewables, and we've seen France issuing a very large bond. Uh, we've seen a number of issues coming from the financial sector. So banks that are going into financing energy efficiency, financing renewables, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I believe that you could structure a green bond on what is fundamentally brown balance sheet. If you look at some of the larger energy companies that are um, from, from, from Europe and from the US, many of them actually have a component of renewables. And if you were to take out that renewable component, it would be one of the largest uh, renewable company for some of them, mm -hmm. uh, both on solar and on wind. So you could structure something. You've got a large aluminum company and they take their power from hydro. This is a reasonably green resource of energy and you could probably structure something. So we would welcome some thought and bringing to the market some of the issuers that are not the traditional issuers, but perhaps utilities that are tilting that balance from fossil fuels to to renewables, just as, as, as you described, Rod, right? So that would actually bring something in for the investors where you can see the transition in terms of a company going from something that we don't like to something that we like a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Frank, please. Maybe to add very shortly to this and the, the importance of knowing for the investor what is green and what is not. Um, the European Commission uh, has also seen the light and has established uh, what we call the High Level Expert Group on Sustainable Finance that I, um, I participate in and um, will, um, which has been charged uh, the, during this year, will come, will come up with a report at the end of this year, uh, with a, a, a overall, uh, if possible, overarching strategy mm -hmm. as to how to green uh, EU uh, financial law mm -hmm. and financial regulations. And this whole issue uh, of taxonomies, um, of, of knowing what is green and what is not, and how you can actually structure green bonds, is an important part of that world. Perfect. Thank you, Frank. I would say only one last question if it's directed at either, um, well, Yuka or here to Ickley, because we haven't <coughs> heard in the discussion from them. Otherwise, I will switch to the final closing remarks so you don't lose too much time of the break. So no questions directed at them, then I would 
suggest a very short one minute final comment and then sure. we have the break. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Let me just say um, that um, very much, I very much appreciate the discussion here around green bonds and thank you also for raising the question. Um, we ourselves, we are partnering with uh, CDP to also work together on um, reporting, climate reporting from a city perspective. Um, the green bonds um, in particular is an issue that is being taken up by cities and cities like Johannesburg, Mexico City have now just started, I mean, not only in the European region, but just outside of that, have started are using that mechanism for indeed um, uh, providing um, their equity to, 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 to good public transportation that is based on a green basis, etc. So things are really starting and I think what I've heard here in terms of advice, I think this is really a very good discussion and, and um, I'm hopeful that um, some of that can actually be activated and I totally agree that it is, um, um, it is necessary to have a discussion about um, when can issuers start to do these green bonds when there is still a part that is maybe not as green, so there must be that discussion. But I think it is important to, 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 to move on um, and, and, and take those opportunities. So I was very pleased to, um, to hear um, about the, um, the uh, initiatives here. One, one final point from a city's perspective, um, what is really going on um, is, is um, and where we try to help as well, is uh, new developments in uh, their public procurement um, uh, mechanisms in particular, we try to drive them to uh, to use a sustainable or green public procurement. We advise them, for example, in the building sector um, on renewables. We advise, advise them on cleaning products. We advise them on public transportation mechanisms of what can actually be considered to be good um, under green public procurement. Um, we have developed with the European Commission uh, numerous guides that is uh, not only for local government but also for national governments to also move into that space. Mm -hmm. So thank you very Wonderful. much. Thank you, Kino. And Frank. Thank you, Michael. Um, the problem is big. We uh, need to solve it urgently and uh, we need scale for that. Um, the public sector cannot do this. It needs to be done in a big part by the private sector, but the private sector cannot do it alone uh, because um, laws that hamper or put barriers need to be taken away. I think that was a very valid point, um, but also certain deadlines need to be set and certain externalities need to be priced. So there, I think there's an interlinkage of two sectors that need each other and that need to talk to each other, need to stimulate each other, and um, therefore I think it makes sense to have in place governance systems that actually uh, make sure that um, that dialogue, that constant dialogue and that constant interaction can be fostered as much as possible. Wonderful, thank you. Als Peter. You just took one point that I wanted to make, so I'm just going to emphasize it. It it literally takes a village. It is a uh, ecosystem. It is an ecosystem of financiers, private sector, government, and a consumer that can make it happen, and that's the only way it's going to happen. Second point, it is going to happen in emerging markets. They are building new economy every few years. If we want to make a difference, we have to focus on that and we have to build green and start green rather than retrofitting years later. And a last point, technology. Technology is critical. The reason why we are seeing uptake from Paris and we're seeing renewables where they are today, 30 countries where levelized cost <coughs> of power from renewables is less than fossil fuels, is because of technology. And that is critical and we need to invest in it and we need to grow that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jukka. <laughs> yeah, maybe I bring a bit of uh, southern voice, although I'm coming from the northernmost <laughs> country of the world. But uh, um, we are talking about uh, instruments and incentives, tax and so on, uh, maybe for the north. I mean, that in the south there is no income taxation you start to even make exemptions and so on. And, and yes, I understand very well that uh, 200, uh, 200 comp major companies or, or 20 major countries of the world will at the moment might make the change. But what about indeed that exponential growth of emissions which is happening in the South? And uh, just to say, you know, there are more children born in Nigeria than whole of the Europe. And, and we have to look a bit long term. They, we have to find solutions for them, get them on board also. With, with our technology, as you said, and with our financial instruments. Um, there is a one, one positive notion from the 
Green Climate Fund, actually, that they set up a motion of call for proposal of accelerators and incubators of technology in developing countries. And that is coming, that there are startups, there are SMEs, there is innovation in the universities, research centers which need this push. And we are looking at now next year whether we can establish that kind of that kind of service for developing countries that they can come up with their innovation because they have to innovate, they have to absorb technologies which we in the north have already maybe tested and they have to start owning them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. And Rod, short and impactful. Well, you know, I just I would just wanted to say, you know, one of the uh, countries that has actually implemented a clean tax cut concept is Kenya. Uh, I was talking to a gentleman this morning who was telling me that Kenya has zero tariffs on renewable energy equipment that they are importing. Uh, so that they, they, have de they have used the, you know, without ever even talking to me, they've <laughs> come up with this idea that they should lower their taxes. But the, the, but the point about that I'm making is, you know, if we can work out an international tax exemption uh, green bond, then there would be buyers in the United States taking the tax exemption to finance a project in Tanzania or Kenya. So, so that you, it doesn't matter what the tax rate is in Kenya, it matters what the tax rate is in the northern countries. So, that, so that, that's, that's, that's the key point. But I just want to re-emphasize that, you know, we have been able to rapidly develop an, an idea over the last year and a half because we've worked collaboratively. Uh, with uh, drawing, drawing in groups of, of, of uh, scholars and experts uh, and donors, for that matter. We have a donor coalition that has funded this work. Uh, but we've drawn in Columbia University, and we've had scholars from Yale, from uh, University of Arizona, from uh, ASU, and uh, MIT. Uh, you know, I'm very pleased, uh, you know, Michael, what you've been able to do to help us uh, you know, convene people here in Europe, and also your colleagues Sergei Paltsev and, and uh, Horacio Kaparan at the MIT Joint Program have offered to help us model uh, these uh, new mechanisms. Uh, so, you know, again, I want to just extend an invitation to anyone here who would like to participate in developing new policy concepts. Uh, it's uh, possibly the most uh, high impact work that you can possibly do is to develop a new idea that makes a difference. So I invite you to join us. Good closing. And I think you'll have opportunity, obviously, to interact with each of them, hopefully outside. Um, just before we head into the break, I think you know, we, we hear about, the, as you mentioned, we hear about the bad news um, on the scientific side. And it's rightly so that we hear that. It is true. It is real. But we're humans, too. And I think it's extremely important that we occasionally hear that actors across the spectrum are developing solutions and opportunities and giving us encouragement. So thank you for that. Join me in thanking our excellent panel.